Oh, it's quiet up here. <laughs> the success in SRE is silent. <laughs> and I'm done. Seen. Um, yeah, hi, my name's Casey, and uh, I'm a failure expert. I mean, I'm an expert in failure. It comes out wrong. So my expertise is in studying failures, uh, particularly uh, complex software systems distributed at scale. And uh, in that line of work, I get to talk to a lot of people like yourself, engineers, architects, SRVs, um, infrastructure people. And uh, recently, over the past three years, I've been speaking to people at higher levels in organizations. So SVPs of like cloud IT, cloud ops, um, CTOs, CIOs, stuff like that. And uh, one thing that's been interesting for me is hearing about SRE programs. And not all SRE programs are successful. So I got really interested in this topic of failures of SRE programs or the unreliability of reliability programs. And I thought, what better way to study this than to get some firsthand experience? So I thought, OK, uh, I should be an SRE for, uh, for a while. And that will really help give me context about uh, this topic. So I put my life on hold for a year. And I got a job as an SRE with um, uh, a large uh, fruit company. Uh, it's a household name, but I won't mention it. Um, and um, I packed up my stuff and moved to uh, their headquarters, which is located off the coast of Maine on this Isle of <laughs> And um, they had a great, uh, fascinating uh, setup there. So they, they mostly deal in apples. They sell apples. They respond to requests for apples. And I'm talking millions of requests for apples per second. And they've got this great tech where they've put uh, apple trees in containers of different sizes, and they place them uh, differently to optimize for different resources like uh, sunlight and moisture and uh, stuff like that. Um, so it looks like this. Uh, sorry, it's a little bit hard to see because uh, they just went under went a, a digital transformation and they put their infrastructure in the cloud. Um, so it's a very typical large distributed socio-technical system, uh, much like the ones that I'm sure all of you deal with. And the first thing I noticed my, my first day, you know, I want to do a good job. I want to make a good impression. So my, my first um, you know, month there, really, I'm looking around for the things that I can tackle as an SRE. And they've got uh, the usual monsters, you know, various lycanthropes uh, messing with their CI-CD uh, pipelines, um, wraiths attacking their load balancers, and um, interesting to me, some uh, wyverns that were uh, literally upending apple carts, which introduced a lot of latency in their inter-island uh, apple uh, delivery. So I thought, that's an excellent place to start. I'll solve that problem. I'll take care of some wyverns, which will smooth out that latency between these services. So uh, that's what I did. I took care of some wyverns my uh, first month there. And I thought I was doing pretty good tackling some, uh, some of the monsters in their infrastructure here. And so in my first monthly review, uh, with my boss, I was feeling like I was getting a lot of great experience and I was in a good place. This was my boss. Uh, his name is uh, James Wicket, and uh, that's like a supervillain's name. So I just assumed that he would be the antagonist of the story. Um, I, I later came to think that he's actually, um, he's actually the goat of managers. But, <laughs> Um, at the time, I thought he was the antagonist, and he, you know, in, my, in that first uh, monthly review, he says, okay, you've took, taken care of some monsters, some wyverns, that's great. What are you going to do for the year? Like, what's your SRE program going to do? And I felt like I was kind of already doing it, so that kind of tingled my antenna a, a little bit, and I was like, well, what do you think you hired me to do? And without missing a beat, he says, we've got a large distributed uh, complex socio-technical system. SRE is part of best practices for guaranteeing reliability of that system. So I need you to guarantee reliability for that system. I'm thinking, well, OK, like, I can't guarantee anything. But uh, beyond that, I feel like the skill set that I'm bringing to the table here is expertise. And that's uh, really hard to describe. But I also can't distill that beforehand. right? Like, um, a normal person might look at this and think, oh, there's some snow in an orchard. Uh, but us experienced SREs uh, are going to see, like, oh, well, there's something hiding there in, in the bushes. And um, computer enhance. 
right? So there's a giant wolf spider in the bushes. Um, only experienced SREs who have you know, identified and battled giant wolf spiders are going to detect that kind of stuff, or similar things. And it's dependent on context, right? So if you have a background in security and um, you see that an instance stops reporting logs, that's going to raise some flags for you. Right? I'm not in security, so for me, it would just be like, oh, that machine's not reporting logs anymore. But somebody with background in security would think that something different is going on there. Or um, you know, if you're going around your organization and you find that a team is building redundant functionality, that might vibrate your antenna. Or um, if somebody's optimizing their service for immutable retries. Or uh, my favorite. Uh, if you have a service that you know uh, can't take load above a certain threshold, and so you build some sort of uh, failover, um, like circuit breaker to, to uh, shed load or something like that, and then you see it take that uh, traffic and go above that traffic, and not only does it never shed load, but it never returns any errors. Yeah. Um, so, but these are the kinds of things that without experience, it's not going to draw your attention to it. So uh, again, I'm, I kind of you know, battled more monsters for that month. And at the end of my second month, I talk with my boss again, uh, James Wickett. And he says, uh, hey, you know, I know you're doing stuff. But again, I need the program for the year, for the next year. And you're just like battling monsters. You know, there's a team down at the port, uh, Ingress port, uh, where this team, this team runs a service where they import uh, mulch and compost and stuff like that. They're battling a, a bunch of cephalopods. Maybe you could go like, you know, make sure that that's reliable. And uh, I hear him say that, but I'm kind of distracted because, uh, you know, it sounds like he's looking for ROI and a, uh, for an SRE program. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. I've written a chapter on ROI in the chaos engineering book. I feel like I'm just talking past James at this point. So I'm like, maybe I can educate him. Maybe I can like throw a book at him and he'll just like absorb that knowledge. And um, even though this is uh, a metaphor about books, <laughs> apparently uh, it's not one meant to be taken literally. Um, so that didn't work. It was a little bit awkward, but we moved past it. And uh, uh, to kind of make amends, um, let's see that one more time. To make amends, uh, I did go down to the pier to uh, check out the giant cephalopod. Here's me hanging on for dear life fighting this giant cephalopod at the ingress port with a service team that uh, handles the importation of uh, compost and mulch. And things did not go well. For one thing, uh, the cephalopod was way too large of a project for me to solve by myself. And I tried to recruit this uh, team, members from the, the service that were running uh, the, the importation there, and uh, that didn't work too well either. So, they had been around for years. They had been dealing with cephalopods for years. They considered it a minor annoyance, but they just kind of made work happen. And their team optimized for two things, performance, throughput, and uh, cost, keeping their, their capacity costs down. So they didn't really understand why the new guy was coming around talking about reliability and trying to change how they do things. I think I have a close-up of that. Yeah, it's, I, was, it was, I was really um, hanging out for dear life there. Uh, so. Um, so that didn't go well. I couldn't really rally those troops uh, to help me, and I felt like I needed more uh, person power. So I thought, okay, well, I know what I'm doing. Maybe if I can, if I can just kind of scale myself out, right? Maybe if there's more me's around. So I got a magic spell and cloned myself and got more me's. Uh, this didn't help either. Um, now there were just uh, more of me's getting in the way of the engineers who were performing the team. They didn't appreciate that. And apparently me's eat a, a lot of apples, so it increased their costs. So they didn't appreciate that either. Um, we did have kind of some minor wins, like with enough me's around, we were able to tackle some of the cephalopods long enough to get uh, more throughput to the service, um, which was good. But then um, you know, that introduced other problems, like their supplier couldn't deliver enough compost and mulch, so they had to bring in other uh, dependencies and things like that. Um, so that was basically my first half year. And uh, at the end of uh, the second quarter, I have another meeting with James Wickett, my boss, and he's still not happy. He's like, I, I get it, you're fighting monsters, you're fighting monsters, but are you guaranteeing the reliability of our system? And uh, at this point, I feel like I'm kind of in the hot seat. Again, I feel like I'm doing good work, but um, I don't have a way to describe it. So I go talk to uh, my brother, um, pictured here. You can tell he works in cybersecurity because of the geese. Um, and uh, I ask him, 
uh, hey, I, tell, I describe what I've done and how I try to scale myself out, and I feel like I'm still kind of in the hot seat, and I, and I feel like I'm doing good work, but the company doesn't seem to recognize that I'm doing good work. And he says, well, there's a lot of uh, similarities and, and interesting differences between security and availability. On the similarity side, like they're basically two sides of the same coin of system safety, right? Uh, security and availability. But security's had more time to mature in this industry because availability wasn't really a thing for tech until there were large online services. So like he goes, you know, don't, don't sweat it too much. Like nobody's gonna thank you for the incident that didn't happen. That's just kind of how life is. So you'll have to find um, another way to go there. But he said, it's interesting that you tried to scale yourself out because in the security world, when executives think about investing in security, they think about investing in tooling and buying products, and products scale, right? So you, you probably, most engineering organizations, the percentage of security engineers that they have is relatively small compared to their, their overall engineering team. So they take money and they put it into products that scale. And uh, on the availability side, uh, what was interesting to him is that when executives think about improving availability or reliability, they invest in people, not in tools. They hire more people. And he said, I don't, you know, that's, that's something that you as an industry either have to mature on or, or figure out. And so I'm trying to figure out like, what actually is the right uh, approach there. I'm, I'm kind of left uh, with that internal debate. On the one hand, uh, resilience requires an adaptive capacity. And uh, only humans can provide that because only humans can improvise with context. Uh, so that would imply that you need people there, but he's right that people don't scale across a, a large organization. So should we be looking at tooling to improve availability? There isn't a lot on the market yet uh, in terms of tooling uh, availability or reliability related uh, tooling. Um, or should we be building internal tools? And um, you know, a lot of the SRE literature talks about building tools to remove toil and automate things to make things more reliable. Uh, so maybe that's an indicator that we should be looking at tooling, but then again, most of that literature comes from Google, um, which is probably the only place on Earth where they have enough uh, engineers who are very experienced with infrastructure and bored that they can cycle 10% of their engineering infrastructure workforce through an SRE program, right? No other company has that problem. So is it because they were blind to that, that they thought tooling was actually improving stuff, but it was actually the extra people there? Or were they actually just building really good tools? And should I just hire people who are like internal uh, uh, product infrastructure engineers? So I've got all this kind of swirling in my head when I go off to meet James's boss. He's, he's like, look, you know, I, you know, we're not seeing eye to eye. You've got to talk, go talk to my boss about justifying the SRE program. And honestly, I feel very ill-prepared uh, for this meeting. Um, and uh, I was right. She starts throwing uh, questions at me like, um, what's your definition of reliability? What's the opportunity cost if we don't have an SRE program? Um, uh, uh, how do you uh, prove, how do you guarantee um, uh, reliability or prove that the, the ROI is successful for this company? And honestly, uh, metaphorically speaking, it felt like fighting a minotaur on flag day. It was just like, bam, bam, bam. These questions knocked me out, right? I didn't have good answers to those questions. So now I'm not just feeling like I'm, um, I'm in the hot seat. I feel like you know, I'm not representing SRE well uh, at all uh, you know, at this company. So I go back and I talk to my brother about this again. And he's like, well, listen, um, it's, it's not just you, it's not just your company. Um, you need to solve this problem because there's a bigger problem behind that, which is that if you don't have a good way of demonstrating or talking about or narrating uh, things about reliability, then your industry is going to uh, be pushed into regulation. And uh, when most of us hear regulation, we're probably thinking something like this, GDPR, like mild annoyances or you know, policies that are good but um, uh, aren't too hard to pull off. That's not the kind of regulation I'm talking about. I'm talking about a horrible, horrible beast. And uh, before, before I say that though, let me just say, normally I'm a very pro-regulation human, uh, alleged human. So uh, the, the, it's not that I'm anti-regulation. Uh, for example, I think 
non-fungible trees should be regulated out of business, right? I don't know if you've heard of NFTs. It's like if apple trees, if you plant them in a pyramid or something, you don't get fungus. I think that's a scam, but that's a story for another day. Um, the uh, beast that I'm talking about is this three-headed monster. And this is what's coming if we can't change the story. So the first head is certification and licensing. The second is uh, uh, punitive measures, uh, fines, and monetary policy. And the third is enforce best practices. This is the regulatory beast that's coming after us. Why is this bad? Certification and licensing. Well, um, first of all, that's going to have an impact that would have an impact on innovation. Uh, I don't know how many startups and small businesses in software are started by people who have a master's degree in uh, comp sci, but it's probably not a large percentage. There are sitting senators who have proposed legislation that would make software engineering a certified profession, which means none of us would be able to do our job. We could not earn a living in this field unless we went and got certified somehow as software engineers, which probably means uh, you know, a graduate degree or something like that. So that would drastically change the nature of our industry. Worse than the innovation aspect, in my opinion, is the impact that that would have on diversity. Our industry already has a serious problem with diversity, and if we raise the bar in this particular way and gatekeep for how people can enter uh, the workforce, then that's going to uh, really impact um, underrepresented groups and access that they have to uh, the lucrative professions in our field. So um, you know, not only is that immoral and unethical, but we also know that more diverse teams uh, perform better. So even if you don't have the heart or righteousness, uh, it'll still hit you in the wallet uh, if uh, diversity is impacted. So the second head is uh, financial punishment, right? If you don't, if your company uh, you know, fails to be fully available, you'll get fined. Large companies will just absorb that cost. They'll get insurance policies and stuff like that. So it won't really hurt them but it could be uh, chilling for small companies. The legal liability could be just too much for smaller companies to even offer uh, services and, and get started, so it will reinforce monopolistic practices. And the third one, uh, enforcement of best practices. Think like compliance type stuff, which security has, but uh, the problem, the worst problem, I think, for our field is that the best practices that a regulatory uh, organization would introduce are things that we probably know and agree don't actually work. So things like um, uh, root cause analysis, uh, uh, redundancy of, of you know, capacity and, and stuff like that, um, action item lists, run books. Uh, let me, I'll just pick on uh, root cause analysis for a second because that's the kind of thing that uh, one of the reasons I, I love studying uh, uh, this field is because there are many things that feel intuitively right, but the data just shows are completely uh, uh, counterproductive to um, the goal that we want, which is increasing system safety. And RCA is a great one like that, because that's the kind of thing a federal uh, organization would be attracted to. Ah, there's a process after an incident that we can follow. And what RCA actually does is it directs attention down to the sharp end uh, the lowest point in the hierarchy, person or code, uh, that was you know uh, geographically unlucky enough to be close to an incident, and it basically uh, places blame down there, which is the place that has the least opportunity, the least capacity to affect systemic change and actually improve reliability, right? So. Uh, there are much better ways, uh, shout out to Howie put together by um, uh, the folks at the company Jelly.io, there are much better ways to direct attention up to things that can systemically improve uh, a system and you know, holistically uh, consider safety and improving reliability. And so we want to do those things, but compliance is probably going to look for things like RCA and push those instead. So we may be forced to do things that we know are counterproductive. And not only will that make our work harder, but it'll also take all of the fun out of it. Because the easiest way to remove motivation is to put paperwork in front of things. Um, so this is a very real threat. Uh, there are uh, op-eds, there was an op-ed in Bloomberg proposing that the federal government regulate availability after the Facebook outage in September and some of the recent AWS um, outages. So now I'm not just worried about my job, I'm worried about all of tech. 
And this group, this audience, SREs, were the ones best positioned to change the narrative, to control the narrative, and shift that conversation in such a way that we can literally save all of software engineering from that horrible monster. So now I'm thinking, okay, how do I prove uh, reliability? So I go down the rabbit hole of quantitative methods. It turns out uh, it's not a rabbit hole, it's actually um, uh, a giant saber toothed ice worm hole. Uh, quantitative methods. So let me just go over uh, a couple of them and, and, and why they're so uh, difficult and why they, in fact, just don't work for establishing reliability, for proving reliability, which is what I feel like I have to do now. Uh, we'll take MTTX first, because SRE talks a lot about MTTX, MTTR in particular. Again, intuitively, this sounds like it's something that makes sense. Mean time to recover. Let's measure that. Let's shrink it. MTTR is a horrible idea. It's a bad metric. Don't use it. Throw it out. The reason why is a secret. But if you want to know the answer to the secret, Courtney Nash will be talking about it later today. Uh, I'll just leave you with one hint. Uh, it's possible over a given period of time to reduce the mean time to recovery and over the same period of time increase the overall time of remediating. So if you have a background in statistics, that might um, tingle your antenna a little bit. Uh, don't use MTTR. So then I'm thinking like, okay, well, what about like nines of availability? Oh my gosh, so many problems with nines of availability. Okay, first of all, you can't measure it. If you're a distributed system and you're looking for availability, then really what you want to know is what the availability is from the perspective of your customers. But in a distributed system, you can't reliably depend on a signal from your customers because they're uh, outside of the system. So let's say you've got some magic spell to do uh, to wave that problem away, or you're just acceptable with the bad data to start with. Okay, fine. Say you've got four and a half nines of availability and you want to improve to five nines of availability. Well, unfortunately, most uh, people in this country don't have five nines of availability for an internet connection. Um, because of the last 10 feet, Wi-Fi's aren't that uh, reliable and their ISPs. Uh, aren't that reliable. So even if you did make that improvement, your customers wouldn't be able to see it, so you wouldn't be able to measure it. Uh, so even if you like magically did make that improvement, you wouldn't be able to prove anything. You wouldn't be able to take that back to your company. Uh, even worse, if you did somehow find a magic number that showed that you improved uh, the uptime of your system, and again, the whole thing I think is ambiguous because a large system at scale, some part of your system is always going to be in some uh, mode of, of degradation. Um, uh, we had this example where uh, we were, we were uh, uh, unable to serve opal apples to um, western uh, Miami uh, because they had passed an importation law that excluded uh, um, opal apples unless you had some certain conditions, but the geofencing from their DNS failed for uh, the western half of the city, so those orders weren't able to complete. Uh, so does that mean that we were down or like just down there, smaller percentage, or was it even our problem or DNS's problem or, or like a legal problem? Like, you know, what is even an outage? I don't know. But let's say that magically you're able to, to measure that. Well, um, the chances are that that increase in availability and reliability is going to be eaten up by some other business imperative. So the, the step forward that you take for availability is then going to be followed by half or full or uh, step and a half back to improve some other quality. And this is just engineering. It's all trade-offs. You're going to optimize for performance and the capacity and the reliability and availability and security and other things. And these are all competing functions that you can't uh, optimize for all of them at the same time. So like in the case of uh, uh, the example of me working with a port, I felt like I improved the reliability by tackling a cephalopod uh, issue, at least temporarily, that increased their performance. But when they got that new um, distributor in to distribute mulch and compost, uh, that disturbed the waters more, which brought more cephalopods in. So the availability then, uh, the reliability then, from my point of view, got wor worse. My work got harder. Um, so basically, quantitative methods dropped me on my head. Okay, that's not going to solve. Uh, this problem, I'm not going to be able to prove reliability in a quantitative manner, which does leave open the possibility of qualitative methods. 
there are, I don't know, an infinite number of qualitative uh, methods that we could approach, like the deliciousness of an apple, right? That's not numeric. It's just we all just know apples are, are delicious. Uh, so I'll borrow one uh, model that I'm fond of called the, the Kirkpatrick method of um, evaluation. This is used kind of in the business world to evaluate training programs and learning stuff. And I, I think that's an appropriate model because really reliability is about learning. This is, this is another thing that resilience engineering does a great job of and organizations like LFI, Learning from Incidents, do a great job of showing us that better system safety problems come from learning, right? Like chaos engineering is about teaching people about their safety margin. That's what leads, that's what moves the needle on availability. That's what teaches people how to uh, operate and maintain their systems in a safer way. So the model has uh, four levels that get increasingly difficult, but all four levels um, can provide some level of ROI. So the first is reaction. Think of an example. Okay, so say, say you install some observability uh, tooling uh, for a service. The first thing you would want to do is establish uh, the reaction. So you go to the engineers on that service and you say, hey, I installed that observability tooling, high cardinality. It's great, right? Thumbs up, thumbs up. And if you're running a successful SRE program, they'll give you a thumbs up. Great. That's some ROI. That's, that's a baseline to establish some value for the work that you've done. The second is learning. Okay, so you go back to the team and say, hey, you know, the observability tooling, have you learned about your system? And they go, yeah, actually, we can see things in our system through the tracing that we didn't know before. So we can establish some learning. That's a better form of uh, ROI. The third is behavior. So you go to that team and say, okay, well, I noticed that, uh, you know, you don't deploy on Fridays. You've got more confidence now. Can you deploy on Fridays? Yes, they start deploying on Fridays. Okay, now you've proved that they've changed their behavior. So you're building up a more successful ROI story for this SRE program. And the fourth and, and final level here is a business result. So obviously, if they're, uh, deliver if they're deploying on Fridays now, they've got a tighter feedback loop. Customers are getting features faster. Feature velocity is a, is a business imperative. So that's a great way, and you might not be able to make it uh, through all four levels, but that is a positive example of using qualitative methods to establish ROI of an SRE program. And notice that the end result isn't reliability. It's not availability. But it's important to the business. So that's just an example of one way that you can build that narrative to make the case for a program, and this is going to make more sense to people at uh, an executive level. Now, personally, I wasn't able to do this in my experience uh, because my reaction uh, with uh, that, that team uh, at, the, at the egress uh, port, uh, uh, ingress port, uh, wasn't uh, particularly positive. I don't think they ever really learned what it was I was trying to do. We just weren't aligned on, on the goals there. So uh, I didn't change their behavior, at least not in the way that I wanted. I mean, when they got the performance bump and were able to bring in the extra supplier, some things happened there. Uh, but the results were actually kind of catastrophic because when they uh, imported from that secondary uh, provider um, on the mulch, they brought in uh, an invasive pest, the rhino-headed apple borer beetle, uh, which decimated the crop. 10% uh, of their trees died in October, which is uh, big for apple season. So um, I was fired at the end of a year. I was let go. Um, but that's okay, because that's a success, because really I wanted to experience the failure of an SRE program. Uh, so I did firsthand, and it completely changed my perspective of the work and how the work is justified at a business level and the narrative and the importance of us reprogramming that narrative now. So these are some things that, that I work with. Um, the Void is the Verica Online Incident Database, uh, Chaos Community Broadcast. I co-wrote the book on chaos engineering, and I work at a company called Verica. Um, and uh, thank you all for coming in person. Those of you who are dialed in, uh, you know, thank you for doing that. I'm really looking forward over the next three days for continuing this conversation about how we change the narrative about reliability and its value, because literally the entire industry of software engineering depends on us doing that successfully. Thank you.